uh, Nathan speaking on the state of DevOps capabilities for building high-performing technology teams. And then of course, you already heard from Adam, um, Adam Sandman speaking on understanding risk in your DevOps pipeline uh, coming from Inflexra. So without further ado. Okay. So what I do know about your company is uh, you've got to you've got to accelerate. You've got to accelerate a bunch of different things, the digital experiences that you're creating for your customers. How do you respond to risk? You have to get faster at that. So here's the other thing I know: we're humans, and if all we do is try to go faster, 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 that's not going to work for us. We have to do this in a way that's humane and sustainable for all of us that are part of the system. And this is where Dora can come. And you all know Dora, right? The Explorer. Yeah. Now you're here. There she is. There's Dora, the Explorer. Uh, that is not the Dora I am here to talk to you about tonight. Instead, I'm here to talk about the Digital Operational Resilience Act. Do you all know this one? Yes. Yes, a couple of people do. No, most people don't. It's EU legislation. It's not the Dora I'm here to talk about. I'm sorry. Uh, but anyone from Ohio? Anyone from Ohio? A little bit? You know what I have in Ohio? They have some of my favorite legislation in the world. The designated outdoor refreshment. <laughs> you know what that means? That means you can go outside and carry your beer with you. Those Ohioans, they know how to park. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not the door I'm here to talk about either. Ah, this one is Dora. DevOps research and assessment. Oh, that sounds like something that's appropriate for this meetup. So, DevOps research and assessment is this multi year program and platform agnostic study into how do we create high-performing teams, high-performing teams that can accelerate those things that you saw on the first slide. Now, a few years ago, Google Cloud, who's my employer, uh, acquired Dora, the research program, but we have continued moving the research forward. And the most important thing uh, to know about the research, aside from everything I'm about to tell you, is that it is program and platform. Okay? It is not, how do you get better at Google Cloud? Dora will never say, hey, you want to build a high-performing team? Just move everybody to Google Cloud. Dora will never say that. I mean, my employer wants me to remind you that if you want to build a high-performing team, move everyone to Google Cloud. But Dora's not going to say that. And I'm more a Dora advocate than I am a Google Cloud advocate. Frank and honest. So when it comes to Dora, what, what actually is Dora? Well, in my mind, Dora is three things. There will be a test. So you have to remember these three things. It's outcomes, it's metrics. And it is capabilities. So let's start with outcomes. What are we here to do? Look, the reason that we use technology is because man, Kubernetes is awesome. And those microservices are good. Badass. And man, if I could just do more serverless, I would know. That is not why we do any technology. We do technology to serve our customers, to move our businesses forward. And so Dora looks at what are those commercial outcomes? What does it mean to have a high performing organization? And, and maybe you look at these and say, profitability, while well, I work in government, profitability is I'm here to serve my constituents. Great. That's, that's a good commercial outcome. That's something that you can use technology to advance, to create a better experience for your constituents, for your customers, et cetera. So we want to look at commercial outcomes. And we know, we know that technology is a thing that can drive all of those commercial outcomes forward. In fact, technology drives that value and innovation that your organization has, except if your organization doesn't realize that. Because in many organizations, even today, probably in none of your but even today, technology reports up to the CFO and is treated as a cost center. How do we minimize costs of all the technology stuff? That's, a, that's an older way of thinking about technology. Technology is there as a business enabler. So we want to use technology to drive our businesses forward. And if you're CFO, if you report to a CFO, or if you are the CFO, technology is the thing that will drive the business forward. If you need me to come share that information with your CFO. All right. So technology makes our business better. And I'm the CFO, or the CEO, or the CIO. I want to know how do, how do I measure technology? How good are we at technology? So, how do I measure my team's capabilities when it comes to technology? What do you think? What are some measures that you've seen? Think about that. How do the developer products data? What is the quintessential measure of developer? Lines of code. Lines of code. That's right. That's right. Lines of code. 
One more. Anyone else? Security vulnerabilities. Security vulnerabilities. Yes, those developers are always introducing security vulnerabilities. They're always introducing lines of code. What is the optimal number of lines of code for the top developer on your team? Seven. Seven? 42. 42? You're going 42. All right, I got two for 42. I got one for seven. I'm sorry, you're both wrong. The optimal number of lines of code for the top developer on your team is a negative number. Because the developer that deletes more code than they add to the system introduces less. Say it again. Security vulnerabilities. That's right. If I delete code, I'm getting rid of it. Security vulnerabilities. And that's better. And also, code is complex and it's complicated. And, and when I write code, what I'm really writing are bugs. So maybe if I got rid of code, wouldn't that be great? That's a good idea, right? If we could just write fewer bugs, we would write fewer code. All right, but look, that's not really the best way to measure developers. Instead, we should look at burn down rates, right? No, not burn down rate either. Sorry, I'm, I'm just calling it a positive. Uh, so here are some metrics that I think are really important. And this is what our research shows us. So we look specifically at software delivery performance. So it doesn't matter how quickly you can write code. It doesn't matter how fast you can create a new feature. If that new feature sits and waits and waits and waits before you actually put it in front of your users, there's no value from it. There is no value in writing code. The only time you get value is when that code is running and your users can interact with it. And so with Dora, we look at these four metrics. Uh, deployment frequency, how frequently are you pushing changes out to your customers? Lead time for changes, from the time you commit the change, until it lands in your customer's hands and they can interact with that. How long does that take? Those are our two throughput metrics. We want to go faster. We want to decrease that lead time for change. We want to deploy more people. But we can't just look at that. We also have to look at the other side, the stability side. What happens when we push a change to production? One of our uh, <laughs> metrics here, the researchers, I'm not a researcher. The researchers call it the change fail rate. I call it the old expletive rate. It's what happens when you push to production and someone shouts out an expletive, right? It means that we have to, oh crap, we have to hot fix this. We have to roll that back. We've got to get people involved in this deployment. We've all experienced this at your previous employers. But we've all experienced it, right? It's not good. So change fail rate. We want that to go down. And then finally, the time to restore service. Here's the thing. We will eliminate as much risk as we possibly can from the system, but we can never eliminate all of the risk. Oh, sorry, I just lied to you. If we turn the systems off, then we can eliminate all the risk. Uh, but there's probably other types of inherent risk in having them turned off. So uh, that may be a conversation for the next presenter. But how quickly do we recover when there is an incident? Now, take these four metrics together. Here's a couple of things that are important about these metrics. You can use these metrics for any type of technology that you're going to do. It doesn't matter if you're developing on the mainframe, if you're developing on a mobile application, if you're developing the hottest, greatest, latest web services, microservices framework on Kubernetes, these four metrics can apply. In fact, I would argue that if you're thinking about bringing in a new technology, the first question you should answer is, how's it going to impact these four metrics? Because if it's not going to help them get better, we probably don't need that new technology, right? Another thing about these metrics, don't ask them at the company level. How frequently does Google deploy? Who the cares? It doesn't matter how frequently Google deploys because it's, it's a very large number. Who cares though? It doesn't tell me anything. What we want to measure is these metrics at an application or service level. Now, an application or service also means you can't just go ask one team because in the real world, most applications or services are not built by an individual. They're built by a team. And they don't make it into production by that same team. Oftentimes, there's security, there's clients, there's QA, there's product owners, there's prior fact. Everybody, you have to consider that team at that application and service level to measure that. Okay. Now, oh boy, I think I'm going to break something for the people that are watching uh, on the Zoom. Or maybe I'm just going to break something on Christina's computer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Right, right. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, can can the zoomers see that? I don't know. Okay, but I can't see that. So I gotta turn my back to you and find the mouse. Can you help me find the mouse? Oh, 
well, wait, it's, it's there. Which way do I have to go? This way. To get to there. Aha. Ah. Yeah, All right. So I'm going to share with you uh, this thing here. We call this the Dora DevOps Quick Check. And we'll put the URL in the show notes or wherever you put URLs these days. Uh, all right, so you, with your team, could gather your team in a room just like this and say, hey, in your next ret retrospective or sprint planning meeting or whatever you do, when you get your team together, ask these questions. Hey, how frequently have we been deploying? What is our lead time for changes? So I'm gonna answer these really quickly. Uh, for a team I used to work on, we were, we were agile, we were super agile. We ran two week sprints. At the end of every two weeks, we shipped off all those changes to production, right? So. Uh, my deployment frequency was, well, between once per week and once per month. You know, that's every two weeks. We would typically, so what's my lead time for change from the time it's committed to the time it's in production? Typically, one week to one month, because, you know, those things that we started at the beginning of the sprint, we sh usually ship them at the end of the sprint. Uh, okay, our time to restore service. Um, well, you know, we're pretty good. Less than a day, for sure. Sometimes it took more than maybe a couple of hours, but less than a day. And then the change fail percent. All right, so end of every two weeks, we take those two weeks worth of changes, we ship them off to production, uh, and then we roll them back. Uh, and that happens way too frequently. I'm going to say 31 to 45% because I'm not going to lie to you because it was about 31 to 45% of the time. Uh, finally, uh, four metrics, five questions. We ask you what industry you're in. Uh, hey, you know, industry, uh, what do you think? How about government? Because, you know, we're here in DC and Jason. All right, so now, this will give me a, an indication of how well am I performing as a team. But what you can see here is that we're like, you know, men, about 31%, like we're in the 31st percentile of all of the data that we've collected within our survey. But, great, I know where I am. I just stepped on the scale and, scale and I see how much I weigh. Do you know what I do every morning when I step on the scale and I see how much I weigh? I get disappointed. I get disappointed and I think to myself, well, how can I affect that? How can I get better? And do you know what, what it turns out? If, if what I do for the remainder of that day is say fewer pounds, fewer pounds, fewer pounds, and then step on the scale, it doesn't actually change. In fact, it probably goes the other way. And in the same way, if what you do is sit around the table and say, we should do more deploys, more deploys, more deploys, you're not actually going to change it. So how do we get better? Well, do I have an answer for you? Uh, so what we investigate in Dora, the third thing is capabilities. What capabilities help you get better at those four metrics? And in fact, we look at a bunch of different capabilities. You can see some of them here on this sort of interactive diagram. So as you might expect, there are technical practices. There are technical things that you can do. You know, things like uh, version control. Uh, if all of your stuff is not in version control, please see me after this talk uh, and we're gonna go learn some Git together. Uh, continuous integration, are you practicing trunk-based development? Technical things that really matter. Your team should have some strength, some ability with each of these capabilities. But you know what? Technical concerns are not enough. We have to think broader than just tech. We have to think about things like process. Uh, for example, what about your change approval process? How's that? Do you hand all of your changes to some external body who doesn't know anything about code and say, Assess the risk of this and please tell us it's okay to approve. That is probably slowing you down and probably not making you safer. And we have data that can back that up. So there's technical, there's process, and then there's also culture. How does your team work together? How is information shared? But here's the cool thing. What we've done in our research is we're doing a predictive analysis. So you see these arrows that are lighting up, for example, change approvals. What this essentially means is that when you're better at change approvals, that's predictive, you'll be better at software delivery and operations. You'll, be, you'll have less burnout on your team and you'll have a better culture and work environment. So what you can use this research for is assess, how is my team doing with these capabilities? Find the one that's holding you back. Go fix that one. And by fix, I mean, change it. I don't know if it's gonna be better or worse, but change it and then go back to those four metrics and say, hey, did they improve? And then rinse and Okay, now for the most difficult task, we're going back to the slides. Oh, look at that. I nearly did it perfectly. Let's see if we can move forward. Yes. Ha. Ah. Speaking of culture, you know, this is how things are holding each other out here. 
How many of you have said or heard this? You don't have to change it. That's all. Because this is how things work, right? But you know what? Things have to change. Um, and and yes, this is how things work around here. But I want you to just close your eyes. Don't close your eyes. But just imagine for a minute what happens. What happens um, if if something breaks? I want you to think about the good days. I want you to think about the time if something breaks in your in your organ. <laughs> Christina, Christina, yeah. I don't know what's. Wrong <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> It might be. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> It's not, it's not if something breaks, it's when, it's when something breaks because oh, no. something, something is always breaking. And so I wonder what happens in your organization when something breaks. Hey, Brian, look, this service is busted again. What's going on? Me? Yeah. Seriously? You. Seriously. I can tell you right now it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean it's not your fault? It wasn't my fault last time. It's not going to be my fault again. Watch. No internet access. Check with the network team. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. That's one. That's one way that you might respond. You may have, have heard that sort of response before. Was Steve good? It's not my fault. Mm. All right. Jeff, something's wrong with this service. What's going on? I am fed up. Fed up. <laughs> fed up. Right. It right. keeps breaking, and I'm pretty sure it's that one person on that networking team who's responsible for all of it. You need to go set them straight. Set them straight. Justice must be served. <laughs> Justice must be served. Are, are we clear? Well, I got it. I got it. Justice must be served. And just to demonstrate how clearly I got it, Teresa. I see this service is busted, and uh, before you answer, I just want to remind you that if you don't get it right, justice just might be served <laughs> on you. Yeah, I noticed that. Man, that service never ceases to surprise me. Um, yeah, I mean, let's take a look and see what's going on. Let's take a look and see what's going on. Let's take a moment to investigate the system. What can we learn from this? This is a. These are three very typical responses to failure. Which one is how your team responds? Don't answer that. Don't answer that. I know. It's, I, I, I know. I know what you're going to say. But look, this this comes from research from a gentleman named Ron Westrom. Dr. Ron Westrom is a sociologist who's done research into uh, a lot of different types of organizations, mostly safety critical organizations. Think emergency workers. Think nuclear power plants. And what he was able to identify through his research is this topology of organizational. And then when you look at this slide, you can find your team and your organization in this slide. Is your team pathological? Are they bureaucratic? Or are they generative? Not surprisingly, what we find is that the high performance teams tend to skew toward the generative side. We want to be over here on this performance oriented side. But here's another thing that I think is really interesting about this. Maybe your team is performance oriented. But your team may exist in a pathological organization. That's what happens in that case. Everyone hates you because you can get shit done. And, and you probably can't get promoted because you aren't doing the things the way that everyone else expects them to happen. So this is not a team level thing. This is an organizational thing. You have to be able to move, help the organization move towards this generative side. All right, I want to talk for a minute about security as well. Because one of the, well, no, I can't put that away. All right, so security is one of the things that we looked at. Uh, and specifically in 2022, in our report for our research, we looked at uh, the security of your software supply chain. Software supply chain, that's such a weird thing. Y'all know what a software supply chain is? It's basically this. I like to say it's from sourcing to serving. So whether I'm writing the source or pulling in a dependency, all the way through until I'm running a service that my customers are using. And the problem with the software supply chain is it's pretty vulnerable. 
there are lots and lots of places where you or worse, a bad actor can come in and inject security vulnerabilities or, or do harm to your system. So we've looked at how teams get better at this this year. And in particular, we looked at two different frameworks. The Salsa framework, which is the uh, security levels for software artifacts, and the SSDF, no without one, right? No, okay, neither do I. No, it's the uh, software secured, uh, secure software development framework, secure software development framework. Both of these provide guidance on what capabilities, what practices, what technology do you need to have in place for your team to get better at securing the software that you're running, the software that you're building. And here's what we found in our research. This research goes out around the world. First, adoption is already done. So you're seeing lots of teams do this, even if they don't know that it's called Salsa or SSDF, because frankly, the labels don't matter. It matters more. But the other thing that we found that's really interesting is that healthier cultures have a head start. Those teams that are working in generative organizations were further ahead on the security game than those teams that were in bureaucratic or pathological organizations. It was the number one predictor of how well you would be with security, this culture. Number two, or sorry, number three, there's some unexpected benefits. Hey, so if you're going to get more secure, you expect you'll have fewer security vulnerabilities and maybe fewer breaches. That's good. Did you know that being better at security practices also is going to increase burnout that you have on your teams? That's what our research shows us. And, and you know, at first it might seem a little odd, but then if you think about it for a minute, well, if I know that I have a security vulnerability in my production environment and I go home for the weekend, probably thinking about stressing about that security vulnerability all weekend, right? While it's open, just waiting for those hackers. If I have better security practices, I can maybe patch that really. And now I can leave work at work, right? Go home and have it. That's too much. Another thing that's interesting is there's a key integration point. When it comes to introducing these security practices, one of the things that we found through our research, because we can tie those capabilities together, um, oh, did I skip ahead? No, nope, I didn't. Is that continuous integration and having strong continuous integration practices is another way that you can drive those security practices. And this is a, a, a description of what uh, continuous integration is uh, and, and what you should expect to have with your team. And I'm not going to read the bullets to you, but I will have some homework. Uh, and we also talk about how do we, how do we fix how do we get better at continuous integration. How about this first one? Agree that fixing a broken build takes priority over any other work. <clears throat> any other work. Practice that? Wouldn't you like to? You know, this is one of the easy things to say and the hard things to do. In fact, in a room right now, I bet I could convince all of you this is the right thing to do. Right until that product owner comes in and says, "Well, we 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 have that press release going out in three hours. That feature has to go out before that press release goes out. So I know it's broken, but just ship it because it works on my machine." Okay, we have to get away from that. some guidance there. But it is true. What we saw was the teams that have above average continuous integration and above average security practices also have the best organizational performance. So getting better at security. One, it doesn't mean you're slowing down. It means that you're improving those four key metrics and you're driving better organizational performance. The other thing about security, here's the thing. When you go back to those four metrics that I talked about at the beginning there, your deployment frequency, your own exports in rate, look, if you need to ship a change, change is a change, is a change is a change. So all the muscles and capabilities you need to ship that new feature. Are the same muscles and capabilities you need to ship a security, like patch a security bar. You have to put that in version control. You have to have uh, continuous integration. You have to have automated tests. Why can't we ship this security bar or this security patch? So we don't know how, how it's going to break everything. Well, that's why we have to have continuous testing in place. Oh, but we want to ship a feature. Great. We've got continuous testing in place. We'll know that it's going to work. So these things all work together. All right. Some final thoughts because the slide tells me I have to wrap it up here, and so does my timer. 
I see this book. Look, at the end of the day, this is the thing that we really care about and what our research is. On the left side of this, we have happy, happy team. Happy team, software developers, operators, SMEs, product owners, and whatever title you've given yourself, that happy team. And you know, a happy team is a productive team. Or wait, is a productive team a happy team? I never get this question. Which is it? Is it a productive team that's happy or a happy team that's productive? Getting thumbs up, right? It's kind of a chicken or the egg problem. I don't know. You're happy because you're productive and you're productive because you're happy. So like, does it really matter which comes first? Just do both and you'll get you know. With this happy team, you improve your software delivery and operations performance. By improving that, you end up with happiness. So whoever your customers are, the organization is getting better. But this is the most important piece. If you take nothing away from your I don't mean the girl with the backpack or the fun area where you can go in Ohio. I mean from the research. It is this. The number one underlying foundational message. You're not going to do it tomorrow. But what you can do tomorrow is take another step forward. What you're going to do the day after that is take another step forward. And the day after that, you're going to take a step backward. And guess what? You didn't know it was going to be a step backward, but now you've learned. And now take that learning and use it for the next step. And so we have to embrace and embody not just a mindset, but also a true practice of continuous improvement, where we take a scientific approach, we change the thing, we see what was the impact of changing that thing, and then we go again. Use Dora to help you find your current constraint. Do something to alleviate that constraint. Learn from that, and then move forward. Capabilities. Technical capabilities, process capabilities, cultural capabilities drive your software delivery and operations performance. We have specific metrics that you can use to guide that. And that is all going to drive better organizational outcomes for everyone. This is the roadmap, except this is not a roadmap. This is a capability map that shows all of the predictions, loosely coupled architecture, predicts better delivery performance, predicts operational or organizational performance. This is how you navigate all of the research here. I say it's not a roadmap because you don't start on the left and just work your way to the right. You start by using this to find out where do we suck? Oh, sorry, you don't suck. Y'all are amazing. But where do you have the biggest opportunity to improve? Start there. So you can start here, you can start there, start down here. I don't know where you're gonna start, but I know that you're not gonna start properly if you don't think about these capabilities. I encourage you, if you haven't already, to download the 2022 Accelerate State of DevOps report. You can grab that URL, you can look at that uh, QR code if you like. And then, um, just giving folks a second to get it for that QR code. Thanks, Lindsay Bell. Uh, and then, maybe even more importantly than important, is please join our community. So, we have an online community and uh, with a mailing list and regular virtual meetups where we have practitioners like ourselves. We have researchers. We have leaders coming in and talking about how do we use this research to drive our teams forward. In fact, on Thursday afternoon of this week, we have Dr. Nicole Forsgren, who was the founder of this research program, one of the founders of this research program. She's joining the community for a virtual meetup, and she's going to talk about a new metrics framework that she's helped develop called Space. So we are literally going to take Dora and launch Dora into space on Thursday. You don't want to miss it. And, and then my final thing, and I'm only a minute and two seconds over, so I'm just going to take 20 more seconds. I said I brought homework to yeah. the Because soon, this year's State of DevOps survey is going to come out. And when I say soon, Trust me, it'll be soon. Like, I don't know, soon. If I gave you a date and it was in the future, you should not believe me. If I said it came out last Tuesday, you could trust that. So it's just like shipping off. I give you, but it's coming soon, like Aprilish. But what I want to leave you with, and for anyone that wants, I have four capabilities here. But what I'd really love for you to do is take these sheets and go back with your team and say, hey, we heard about this dude who spells his name wrong. And he had these ideas and we look at things like, what is our organizational culture? What is our continuous integration practice? Our loosely coupled architecture capabilities and our streamlining changes. And with your team, sit around the conference room and say, hey, 
Uh, I am confident I can get changes through the approval process in a timely manner. And then you can say that you strongly disagree, or strongly agree. I don't know how well you feel about getting your changes through the change approval process, but you and your team should debate that and understand how are you doing against these four select capabilities selected at random from the district. With that, I want to say thank you so much for coming out. I will be around for this. Without further ado, we have Adam Sandman from Inflectra. As the title suggests, you always have to think about risk, and there's a risk of that not working, so we have to back up. Um, so first, and thanks so much for having me today at the event. I appreciate it. Um, it's great to be back in person. And this is a little bit about me. That's really not that important. Um, been living in the D.C. area for, wow, 20-something years. Uh, worked in technology, worked at a company called Sapient that was based just down the block on Courthouse Road. And then in 2006, started a company to help improve quality, uh, improve delivery, and reduce risk, which is why we're here today. And I appreciate, it again, being here. Let me... Uh, so, hold on. Uh, yep, yep. Let's try the old. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so just a little bit about the uh, spectrum, those who are curious. Uh, we help you, anyone here in the room, hopefully, your company, your organization, deliver quality software faster and with lower risk. And we've heard a lot about speed and acceleration. And one of the things we have found talking about our customers is that um, you go faster. But if you don't if you keep the quality, if you keep the quality as you go fast, so you're not making this better, you're actually increasing chaos. And if you go back to the Agile Manifesto and the, 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 the tenets of DevOps and continuous testing, it's not about creating chaos, it's about delivering value to customers faster. Uh, and customers really care about quality because if they don't, uh, when you have to deliver value, you've actually diminished that. Business value is about delivering software that works, that's reliable, and risk is a key part of that. And what we found is talking to a lot of our customers, risk is something that's grossly underappreciated, that's under, I think misunderstood, and it tends to bite you when you least expect it. Um, for example, you know, we've talked to some clients of ours that are uh, trying to test performance of one of our systems, and they were like, well, you know, you know, what would be really easy is if we took our entire production database, copied it into development, and just did some performance testing with that. And we want to test all the email functionality works as well with all their real emails and all these European Union uh, you know, privacy rules and California privacy laws. And we were like, you know, this might not be the best idea. And this is a very large multinational IT company who will remain nameless. They're protecting about probably my safety. Um, you'll find me under the concrete slab otherwise uh, outside the office. No, but seriously, companies don't appreciate this. They, they just, they're so busy. Focusing on, we've got to get this performance testing done. We've got to do it quickly. We haven't got time to do anything else. They don't think of well, what are the risks? What could happen? Email everyone in that company's information out. We could have data leakage. We could uh, you know, do a whole bunch of other problems. We could go to jail. So when you start talking to, to companies about risk, it helps to really formulate. And that's why I thought this presentation would be very helpful. So you can actually see why it's so important, what it is, how you manage it, and how you can reduce it. And then specifically in DevOps, we're looking at pipelines and of automation. Uh, where does risk play into that? I'm um, happy to take some questions uh, as we go and, and at the end. Um, so before we do that, just quickly, this is uh, our company, the products you may have heard of or not heard of. Uh, these are the features we, we focus on, uh, requirement, requirements management, planning tools, test automation. Uh, we also have IT service management, uh, a complete suite for managing quality. Um, and I'll talk more about that at the end, but that's not what this is about. What we're here to understand is risk. So first of all, what are risks? Well, risks, interestingly enough, risks can actually be positive as well as negative. So winning the lottery is actually considered a positive risk. But actually, if you hear about people winning the lottery, they usually commit suicide within two or three years of winning the lottery. Maybe that makes sense. Um, but no, it's just any profound change that's either positive or negative unexpected is effectively a risk. And risks will impact organizations, they'll impact teams, they will in, uh, impact software, products. Um, you know, when you're looking at you know, building a data center, look at where most of the main data centers are, are built. They're placed in places with low seismic, seismic activity, with good power, good cooling. They do a risk analysis on those types of infrastructure to make sure that they account for the risks that can happen. And the same thing in software, we have to think about what are the risks that could happen to systems we're developing, putting into production every single day, and how do we 
minimize the risks whilst going live and in keeping the value stream flowing. So first of all, when we're talking about software, there's really three kinds of risks. And this is an interesting framework that I was introduced to oh my, 12, 10, 12 years ago, uh, back when Agile was coming out and new. The, so first of all, when we think about building systems, it's easy to build software, but it's very hard for us to make sure that it's software that actually meets the, the needs of the end user. How many times have you worked on software products where you end up designing features, building a user interface, someone tries to use it, and you know, they go, this doesn't meet our needs. It doesn't actually work for us. It technically works. It does what we ask you to do, but it doesn't actually deliver the value. It's usability sucks, or the a whole business model behind it just wasn't right. And so by delivering you know, spike solutions, using prototyping, two week sprints, we try to actually reduce what's called the conceptual risk. Is the concept even valuable? Does it make sense? Second type of risk we often look at is the technical risk. Uh, when Apple came out with the very first iPhone, uh, it didn't actually run on the at and network very well. Um, they hadn't really proved up the technical risks, but the concept, they put the human features together into a, the first ever smartphone. They were focusing very much on the conceptual risk of how does the user use a device they've never seen before. And if you actually watch the Steve Jobs video on the concept side, he actually sold us three products. It's a smartphone, it's an MP3 player, and it's a mobile internet device. And at the end of the presentation, only at the end, does he show all three becoming one? Because he knew at the beginning of that, that movie, it's very, very powerful, people didn't understand the concept. He couldn't say this is a smartphone. What is a smartphone? And there's a great book actually called Selling the Wheel, if ever you are interested in innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, it's about the, the fictitious account of someone who invents the wheel and how they sell to people. People are like, what's a wheel? Why do I need a wheel? What does it do? I've got buggies, I don't need a wheel. So Trying to solve these different types of risks is really important, and they often, again, play off each other. So in the iPhone example, they were able to mitigate the conceptual risk, um, but the technical risk, they didn't flash up to many, to significantly later in its life cycle. People would buy the phone and didn't work on AT&T's network, and of course, they upgraded the network. There's another example of this too, but risk, again, it's conceptual, technical, and the third type of risk that people always think about is, well, it's a great product, or will it be on time? You can have the world's best product, you can have, well, have the best technology, but if it's months after your competitor, it will be forgotten. So again, the third action risk is, will it be delivered on time, delivering the value where it needs to be delivered? <clears throat> because if something is not delivered uh, at the, when the business needs it, it doesn't matter that it was the best. So when thinking of risk, how can you, in, in your everyday environment, when you're building new products or building new features in your, in your pipeline, how can you think about the technical risks, the conceptual risks, and the schedule risks, and make sure that you're adequately thinking of all of them? So here's some examples here. You can get feedback on the conceptual risk, the risk functionality, get real users to look at it, don't just get the product owners to look at it. They may be a proxy for the end user, but get it in the hands of real users, use real data. We've actually often found with the first one, it's so easy to you know, build a system, build some functionality, and load it with like, you know, user one, user two, user three. You know, blah, blah, one, two, three, four, five. People go, oh, it's a great application. It looks great. And then you put in some sample data that actually looks like the data and they go, well, this is useless. I'm an I'm a insurance claims assessor. I can never use this. It makes no sense. But well, they may have looked at it with, with um, you know, fake dummy data and it actually made sense to them because they didn't understand it because it, it wasn't real. So you put it real data, make it look real, have a real user try it in their actual environment. If it's being used by an Uber driver, but into a car, have them drive around trying to use it. It's really important to understand the context of your users so that you can actually get, make sure they actually truly see it in place. Get something tangible so you can give you feedback. Technical risk. Um, I faced this one on a real project I was working on. Um, it's quite crazy, really. We were building something for the US Marine Corps back in uh, around the time of the Iraq War, which is basically almost 10 years ago now. Um, it's, the it's the anniversary, right? Yeah. I was in Britain last, last week and they had all these talk shows of people calling in about the war. And, um, so we were in 29 farms in the beginning of there, or it's a hostile desert, and they needed to test all their equipment. And so six months earlier, they'd asked us to build um, a wireless tech, uh, communication system that would communicate the supplies and logistics with all the different you know, units in the field. And they said, we're going to test it by using this very primitive radio system called Singard. It's a frequency hopping radio. It's highly encrypted. It's like 300 or 12. It was very low. 
So we said, okay, we're going to simulate it in the lab. So we're going to build this application. We're going to we're going to do the application. We're going to develop it. We're going to simulate this using some modems. And it's going to be awesome. And we did all that. And six months later, we had all these different versions and all the different sprints. And it was a great piece of software. And we took it out to 29 Palms and put the radios up and the antennas and in the desert and these little kids and bikes biking around and saying, what are you doing, mister? And kind of it's an interesting place. And then we turn it on and nothing works because we never ever tested it with the actual hardware. We could have, of course, gone down the road to a Marine Corps lab and borrowed the hardware, but a little busy, oh, other things to do. So again, technical risk. Make sure you understand how something's going to be used and try it out, not the whole system, but just try out simple point-to-point -point communication, whatever is the riskiest technical solution, make sure you have that accounted for. So for example, when people do their, their minimum viable product, it's very common that you will actually pick some features that are very impactful for the business. You'll put this into your MVP, it looks very sexy, and everyone loves it. Oh my God, it's so great. I'm gonna love this uh, application, it's gonna be really good. And then no one's thinking about what are the technical risks? Prove those out too. So maybe in the first 10 sprints, pick out the most technically challenging things that you've identified and make sure you do those. Because always what happens is you've got a great prototype that will never work. And the whole point is to these first early releases should, should move out the risk across those three different axes. Uh, same thing with the schedule risk. You know, if, if you understand it's gonna take you X amount of time to do this much functionality, figure that out, build some metrics so you can figure out as a team, obviously will improve its velocity, they'll know the system better, they'll know the tech stack, you can use that to prove out your schedule. But if you don't know what your team's velocity is at the beginning, you may give someone an unrealistic estimate and then suddenly you're in a world of hurt. So these are three key areas of risk. Here are some ideas of how and when and you should be able to mitigate. Um, and it's really important to do that. Otherwise, all you're doing is building up a lot of pain. And I don't like pain. So next. Now, when we talk about risks, uh, I'm not sure how many of you have like, played around with risk theory and risk management. And, uh, sorry, um, and so there's two main axes that generally we think about risk. There's a third one I'll mention afterwards. Um, how likely is the risk? And secondly, how bad is the risk? What's the impact? So first of all, what you typically want to do is get your team together, maybe get some pizza and beer like we have tonight, and say, hey guys, what are all the risks we can think of that can go wrong right now in the system? And make sure you've got some naysayers. Find the people that you know are the most pessimistic and get an extra beer and make sure they're there. In fact, I did a project review once and someone said, find the most pessimistic, negative person on your team and make sure they, they you, you have an hour with them and just ask them everything can go wrong and write it all down. Because something will go wrong. You don't know which one, but something will. So basically identify all the risks you can think of and then categorize them by just how likely they are. And it's really important to do that separately from the next activity, which is if it happens, What's the impact? People often think, oh, this is a really bad risk. Well, there's no bad risk or good risk. There's just risks that are likely, and the risks that they happen are serious or impactful. For example, uh, you know, what's the risk that lightning will hit, I don't know, your data center? Probably unlikely, but if it happens, probably pretty, I guess, potentially pretty bad. I don't know. I don't, I don't build data centers, but maybe it's maybe really bad. Um, what's the risk? that you know, the bug in your code or vulnerability are pretty high statistically. What's the, what's the impact? Oh, pretty high too. So look through these different metrics, figure out all the risks from the most unlikely from you know, asteroid hitting planet to you know, bug in code. Very likely, very unlikely. Same thing with the impact, do the exact same thing, rank everything separately. And then you put the two together, you get your exposure. So what you find is there are some things which are certainly gonna happen and they have to be bad. And those are almost like issues. They almost happen now and they're terrible. But these are you're gonna do these are things you're gonna do anyway. You're gonna know they're gonna happen. It's pretty pretty uh, cut and dry. Where people often get tripped up is is when you get to the possible and likely, but catastrophic and, and, and um, critical things that are maybe will happen, and possibly you might even think about the unlikely but not rare and catastrophic. Because these are the things that as humans we tend to discount. Um, so it was you know, interesting. I was in, I was traveling last week, uh, and I was reading a copy of the Economist uh, newspaper, and it was talking about the startups and fund finance and all these problems. And the quote said, "Oh yeah, we don't see a lot of problems. We think 
you know, these, the startup economy is pretty healthy. Uh, we, you know, we don't see any systemic risk in the system. Now, this, is the, this was the economist, by the way, from the week before, because I had it on the plane with me and I'd forgotten to get the latest one. And I said, oh, it's, it's interesting. You know, I have a startup company. I care about this stuff. And it goes, oh, uh, so-and-so, so-and-so, Silicon Valley Bank. Um, a week before, they hadn't thought about the risk, systemic risk in, in their financial portfolio. All these, all kind of every single loan they had was 30 years long, et cetera, et cetera, really diversification. So they didn't think of that a week before it completely collapsed, UBS, you know, last week. And, and the same thing with, with the security hacks like SolarWinds, or there's a uh, telco in Australia that did the exact same thing I mentioned at the beginning, where they used production data for testing, biggest data, data breach in Australian history. I mean, this, this stuff is, you know, go to newspapers, go on any of these websites, databreachnews.com, which I, I get every day. I mean, it scares the shit out of you. I mean, there's so much stuff where people said, oh, there's no way that could happen, but it does. So when we think about risks, I always say this is the, the area of most concern, a likely possible and critical and, and catastrophic, because as humans, we think it's less likely, but it could happen. And that's where you should spend some time. Think about that in your pipelines, in your code, is there anything you know of that could cause something that would be catastrophic to your company? Uh, data, whether it's data privacy, data security, or performance. I mean, performance stuff is always the one that's, you know, it's always done at the end and uh, very hard to diagnose and stuff that goes, oh, there's no way that could ever happen. We, you know, that's, how, that's what happens. So again, look, it's a very good framework for quantifying risks. Now, there is a third measure which isn't in here. If any of you work on embedded systems like uh, pacemakers, medical devices, uh, automotive, aerospace. There's a third measure called detectability, uh, and that's a third factor you often put in. And the reason why you put that in on, on those kind of systems is if you've got a risk that's hard to detect, it's actually more risky because you can't find it. So there are situations where you may have a third, again, there's a third metric on this, which makes it more complicated. Uh, and again, I'm happy to spend hours talking about risks with anyone here. We can go deep into all that stuff and geek out. But risks are really important because uh, they help you find the problems before they find you. Now, how do you uh, reduce risks? Uh, there's things called mitigations. And so the language of risks are, you wanna take, oh, so just to explain. So these, uh, you put these two numbers together and you get what's called an exposure. That's the multiplication of the, uh, the, um, the score of the uh, impact and the score of the probability. So a high, a very certain thing that's very bad is uh, 20 and there's something that will be very unlikely and very low if it did happen is one. So when you put those together, you want to be able to reduce your aggregate exposure before something lower. The problem is mitigation. Mitigation is a way of reducing typically one of the two. You make it less likely or you make it less worse. So data center example is what I often use. Uh, lightning hits the data center. You can either reduce the probability by putting a lightning rod or some kind of Faraday cage or something that makes it impervious. Now that the second thing would be if it does happen, um, have a second data center somewhere else. One reduces the probability, one reduces the impact. When you look at mitigations, you might look at things that reduce one or both of those axes. And you can have multiple mitigations because you want to have like defense in depth. As you, as you know in security, the idea is that whatever shield you have, someone's going to breach it. If you build a, 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 some kind of you know, mitigation that potentially reduces that risk, it's not enough. Always have as many possible that will reduce the risk that you have. So the idea again is to reduce that risk from something that is catastrophic and, hard and highly likely to either being, well, if it happens, we've got backup plans, or it won't happen because these things were better happening, or maybe it's a combination of the two. So it's really important to think about what are the mitigations and document those, have those be part of your plan, and have your team review those. Part of, you know, the end of, end of the sprint, it's part of the retrospective. You know, what risks do we, do we introduce? What risks have we, redu have we reduced or mitigated? So another thing we talk about risks then is back to DevOps and it's continuous testing. So have any of you seen this before? Okay. <laughs> now you've all seen the inner part, which is the DevOps loop, but have you but also continuous testing? So I speak quite a few testing conferences. And one of the things that they always ask to try and trap the attendees, like, where's the testing? And everyone's like, well, I don't know. It's doing the verification. It says it right there, verify. And maybe not one, it's we gotta, we gotta do testing throughout, which should be maybe it's here. So the answer is you should be testing, especially in a model system, you should be testing throughout. You're testing as you're developing the software, you're testing in the design, testing the requirements, testing user stories. Uh, you, when you go to the production, you've got real-time monitoring, 
as, as we said earlier by Nathan, if you have to put it in production and it doesn't work, you can roll it back. And that's testing in production. That's monitoring and undoing changes. In a modern you know, DevOps environment, you're testing at every stage in different ways. So that's continuous testing and DevOps. And that is a way to reduce risk. Why is that? Well, because, excuse my dancer, uh, first of all, we heard about, we talked about something called shifting left. So shifting left is the idea we're going to test earlier in the cycle and, and so on. But why do we do that? Well, one of the reasons we do that is because testing is a way of, of experimenting. It's a way of finding out what's going on and identifying risk. Uh, so an example would be if you were to have in your, you know, your pipeline that runs every single day, your feature branches are being built, they're going to have hopefully unit tests in the feature branch. Uh, you're not running your entire suite, you're running some of them perhaps. And maybe you identify a few failures. Okay, we can fix the failures in our feature branch and merge into the main branch, into the develop branch, you're using Git flow anyway. Um, and then when it goes into that branch, it passes, but you're thinking, that, well, what failed? Would it be nice to look at those sections? And so what you find is the things that failed earlier, doesn't just, it isn't just a matter of fixing them, it also informs you that there's risk in that part of the system. The fact that we have an issue that we've now fixed means that when I merge into they develop, I want to spend more time running a much more detailed suite of tests, automated manual combination uh, in that area. So, and the same thing, if you find that your, your pipeline is running slower, maybe even just performance issue. Now it's not determinative. It doesn't mean your application has got a performance issue, but if your pipeline is taking X, X percent longer than it used to, you may have something. The same thing if it goes faster. Wow, it's gone better. So the whole idea of shipping left is not just to test earlier, it's also to inform you where there's risk for testing more later, because you're not shifting all the testing left because it would just take it just as long. The whole point is to shift as much as you can left so you can focus on the later stuff and, and focus that later part where there's risk rather than running every single test in your entire suite every single time, irrespective. And that's called your know, risk-based testing, we can call that. We're just taking the risks and focusing the testing on that. Okay, same thing we shift to right, you can now go into production and use some of those lessons that you learned from your testing to figure out where the risks are in production and make sure you're adequate monitoring. So you're using risks to do that. Okay, so some other things that we've learned as well are in terms of risks will be this is some pictures from the uh, sample projects is that businesses, the business has you know impact. If you have a part of the system that's got very high business features, so these are user stories, four user stories are the most important for business. Do you have adequate coverage from your from risks and from in the system? So you can actually take all the risks that you have as a defined, map them back to your user stories, and then see, wait a second. If all these if these risks all tie back to these stories, and these stories have test cases that go with them, when the tests fail, those tests will reduce my aggregate risk the most and will also cover the most. In business value. So if I have time to only create automated tests for a certain part of my application, I should want to cover as much of my high priority features, obviously, and also reduce my overall aggregate risk. So what you start to do is instead of spending all that time running thousands of you know, UI Selenium tests or you know, as well as your unit tests in your um, API service layer tests, you can focus the effort on where is the most risk to be reduced so you can actually spend the, the time the most efficiently. And that will reduce the overall impact of any single failure. The second thing we find is that when people have badly designed something, you'll often see a lot of defects. We find that when we talk to our customers, they have loads and loads of defects that tie back to a certain number of key user stories because those user stories were maybe written a long time ago. Maybe they weren't as mature as an organization. The unit test coverage was weaker. The um, design was the design issue, whatever it is. And instead of fixing thousands of bugs, you find that particular user story and maybe uh, what other members of the team worked on had an issue. And so it's a way of basically saying, if there are historically been issues with this particular feature, we might want to spend some more time either adding more tests for it, uh, going into the design, doing a code review, refactoring it, um, whatever needs to be done. But basically it's got technical debt that's built up in that particular feature. Just because, so what you're saying is the probability of an issue of a risk is there, even though we're not necessarily sure if, it, if there's any impact, so the fact that area of the system has historically had so many issues means there's a higher probability of there being an issue there. The same thing we found from an impact standpoint is certain key parts of your application have disproportionate impact to the rest of the application. We had a client that had a system they were, they were testing where uh, it was like the, the, the main menu didn't work. 
the main menu is not particularly complex. People then think, oh, it's not a particularly important thing, the menu, you know, you just have to display there. If the menu doesn't load, you can't get to any other page in the application. So what we can actually do is, and that's obviously an egregious example, but there are other examples where there are pages which are key user choke points. So this is something from Google Analytics. So there's a thing called user flow. You can find, just using GA, uh, where in your system are the key points where everything funnels to a certain user flow. If anything breaks in that user flow, people can't get to that part of the application. So even if you have 99% of your, of your screens work, 99% of your screens work, but they're all accessed through and one screen that doesn't work, 100% of your application is broken. And that's one of those things where even though that risk in theory is small, the, the, the probability is 1% of the application, the impact is huge because the user can't get to anywhere else. So we often will look at where are the critical user flows. So if something does go down, where can you actually, uh, where should you roll back? Where should you be putting extra effort? And the other one is code commits. Uh, as someone I think Nathan mentioned, where if, if developers make zero commits, you get no, no bugs. So looking at tying back every, every change and actually connecting it back to different features and seeing, well, all of these commits touch one feature, maybe that one feature should be looked at. And there's some really neat tools coming out in the market that not, not from us, um, that we've been, we're looking to maybe partner with, that they actually can scan your code base. It's pretty neat. They can you scan your code base and they can then correlate it with the, your UI and they can actually tell you which uh, of your, say, Selenium scripts or Cypress scripts should be run. And, and so what it will do is you run, your, you run your pipeline and it runs the test multiple times and it starts to learn. And it will actually tell you, well, based on these commits here and here, and that tied previously to a failure, it will predict that when you make this commit, you should run these scripts and not those scripts. So if you, so if you want to cut your build pipeline down, it can say to maximize the impact of the testing in, your, in this finite time period that you have from this only. So there's a lot of cool stuff with AI. This is all just you know, basic, uh, simple data, simple metrics, but AI is going to take this and turn this into this real time. Again, we're still getting to that point, but it's pretty amazing. We're going to have tools that will literally tell you based on what you just committed, all the tests should be run, where the risks are, and hopefully improve outcomes. Uh, and put it together, this is just an example of how you can put it all together, come up with a grid, the ground. If I only have time to do certain amounts of testing and you know, looking at code and refactoring, where's the, where's the risk in the system? It's basically we're plotting risk against every single feature. Uh, and so in this example, if I only have time to investigate certain areas, I'm going to look at here, here, uh, here, here, all the ones that are relevant, bottom, which is so it's just a way of prioritizing where the, where the risks are in your system based on the different data points, whether it's the requirements, the risks, the code changes, uh, the user flow, and the um, number of the previous defects and commits. And there are tools in the market that help you do this. Again, we're still in, this early, in the early phase of this. If you look, if you look at risk-based testing, it's a huge area of, of uh, development. And I think one more thing, I just wanted to do a quick plug. Um, we, do, we are having a conference in April, uh, April 19th or 20th in DC. Uh, we've got some discount tickets on the table here. So if you want to come, it's two days. You can buy one day tickets. We've got some special discounts here on the one day tickets. Uh, some great speakers from the local agile community uh, and the testing community. We've also got some international speakers coming in as well from the Netherlands. Uh, we've got Paul Gazaki coming in from Texas, not that so far. Uh, other folks you may recognize. Um, Jemini is an AI company. She's always a great speaker talking about cool AI stuff. Um, as well. So feel free. Oh, and we are even talking about mainframes and DevOps and mainframes, uh, which I thought was an oxymoron, but it's not. So feel free to uh, learn more about that and get, come get our swag afterwards. Thank you.